Hi Sachin. Hey Dinkar. So today I wanted to talk to you about Dinkar, uh, a very difficult topic for a lot of people, but I heard that you have uh, made some uh, progress into that is as a ThoughtWorks who is vendor to many customers, we are building software for our customers. And typically in an enterprise setting, there are many teams which are supplying software to their consumers who could be business. That's what we call them. And uh, it is very difficult for an engineering team to think about what is the value of the system which we are delivering. One obvious thing which I have, uh, and you and I we typically talk to a lot of people around this is, what is the actual value we deliver? And the most obvious answer is the absolute value which I'm delivering. It's like code, the quality of the code, the parameters, the technical specifications. But that is not the, uh, the whole value. Why even the enterprise is funding for that program, basically. And uh, how would you go about it? Oh, who are typically parties which get affected by it? And I heard that um, you have this three-circle theory where there is an immediate recipient and then there are two more circles, which I don't want to break, but uh, would like to hear from you about that. Sure, Sachin. So uh, I, I do want to um, start that the, with the views presented in this podcast are, are ours and not necessary of our employer. Uh, yes. Right. And uh, the, uh, the learnings that we have is kind of abstracted out of a uh, lot of conversations that we are having with other colleagues who are uh, in different organizations in similar uh, scenarios, right? And um, while a lot of people may think that uh, these are applicable only to uh, consulting, software consulting kind of organization, it may only be applicable to services, software services kind of organization. One of our learning has been that these are applicable to all kinds of organizations, uh, startups, uh, you know, uh, scale ups, small medium enterprises. In fact, one of the biggest uh, consumer of this thought process, um, in uh, you know, to me for for me are people who are actually uh, an IT house of a large enterprise, and like any IT house, there are multiples of these in different locations. Right, everyone today kind of mitigates by having them. In, geographically distributed um, location. So, uh, you know, um, the, the the reason why this uh, Sachin is becoming very important and why people are struggling a lot in this is because, you know, there was this, um, you know, uh, the, the, the there was this whole thing that uh, there was business and IT was on the side supporting it. Um, and then uh, the business and IT became very close to each other and they kind of started pairing it. And what the reality of today is that uh, the tech has become core of the business, right? And what a lot of people take that is uh, that technology is a business model in itself. Technology is very critical to the whole business. That means the business leaders are understanding more about technology. I mean, so many earning statements, people are saying, we are talking about this technology, we are doing this, we are doing this, right? They're no longer just talking about the their core business, but even though they're, they're not an IT uh, or a tech company, but they're still talking about the technology, right? Because it's so important, it's so central. What that means on the flip side is that it has become very in, important for technology leaders to also understand the business. It's not one way street, right? And a lot of technology staff, you know, struggling with it. I mean, on a lighter side, a lot of technologists became technologists because they were not good at MBA subjects, they were good at <laughs> subjects, right? So, so it yeah, has yeah. come full circle now, you know, once they have uh, reached that stage, now they have to go back and uh, uh, learn all those uh, things all over again. And uh, that's why the previous session that we had on um, how to articulate the business value uh, of uh, your uh, the work that you're doing becomes very important. And adjacent to that is to understand uh, who is it you're talking to, right? Because for a lot of people in technology, there is this, uh, you know, art cloud, which is like business, right? Uh, the, the, something fuzzy, which is like out there in the business. It's very important to understand what are these audiences? What are their motivations? What they're trying to do? 
and kind of uh, and that helps in figuring out what to talk to whom not because that is something that we should go and talk to but because that those are the things they are worrying about those are the things they are responsible for and as a good corporate citizen it's our responsibility to provide that information to that set of people so that they can do their job better right so in this whole scenario a technologist now is not just a technologist but uh, you know is also a, a business proponent of the work that a technologist is doing and is also now am um, in in some way an organizational whisperer who now knows that who needs to hear what message so they can amplify that message and bring maximum value to the organization in whatever capacity they're doing and somewhere as i started organizing these um, stakeholders if we call them you know direct stakeholders indirect stakeholders uh, and uh, kind of you know you do you, you collect all this information you start abstracting out that's where these three circles uh, came into so yeah. let me share my screen while i'm doing that i would love to hear um, what your experience has been uh, going from a technologist to an organizational whisperer and you know a learner of business concepts dinkar the uh, you stated at the beginning very nicely on a lighter note is nowadays it is not good enough for you to only be technologist it's it's uh, and not because you want to articulate value hmm. it's also to understand the perspective and constraints where like the the other part is actually thinking um and that's why it is very important for anybody who wants to be successful in industry today to understand what the business constraints are earlier we were only order takers where you get handed over a specification and uh, it will say thank you so much here is our estimation for that and they will yeah. say okay here is a budget for you and you say here is a product for you but then that contract was so transactional um it was not anywhere uh, and that's why you see that the systems and anything which was developed was so substandard because these two worlds did not understand each other enough but now as you precisely mentioned some of the only thing i want is it's not was in many areas it still is unfortunately yes <laughs> <laughs> but I, i that that is something which i realized that it is not good enough for you to just think in the technology realm because <clears throat> then you become little dogmatic in terms of your opinions mm -hmm. uh, and you also start thinking technology is because you are in that whole cocoon you feel this is the superior thing but when you start seeing a bigger picture of uh, today's businesses the business is now although even tech at core companies like think about uber right uber is a technology company nobody will argue about it but the amount of machinery around uber hmm. which exist um without that that technology platform will have not a single user yeah so uh, people who are working on uber platform they need to understand the constraints in which uber operates there are a lot of things which are these technologists if they don't understand they will take a very uh, high ground and they will say this is not how it works the latest example and that's why this t-shirt by the way i want to throw myself into gpt and see what comes out of it so uh, but the point is uh, these moral and ethical dilemma which people are actually facing as a technologist but there are a lot of people on the business side they see yes these are challenges of today's technology but we need to surpass them and they will get addressed uh, mostly policy follows technology right so uh, business nowadays is very savvy about technology as you rightly mentioned it is time high time that most of technologists to become savvy about business at least in the understanding part of it so what you are going to tell i'm so much looking forward to yeah. the one sidebar i mean uh, i interestingly um, in india i see some a change where policy is actually leading technology i mean it's very <laughs> fascinating that you know having grown up in india that sarkari thing right now it's 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 crazy to see that it's no sarkari babu log and politicians who are driving this innovation where the technology is actually lagging uh, the policy makers 
and this whole uh, India stack, uh, right? The payments and everything, how policy actually led and drove technology uh, and adoption in a direction that, that flip uh, personally has been a very interesting uh, thing to witness. Yeah. I don't know how it happened, what is the chronology, but uh, the, uh, whatever I could read in public media, in fact, some of the corporations were against UPI. I don't, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, in the beginning, they were actually against RBI doing this and they didn't want uh, government to actually come into this. Whereas mm -hmm. government said, uh, it's okay that you feel threatened because of the prolification of what we want to achieve, but India is a mass country and they yeah. need a cheaper solution. And at least uh, some part uh, has to be played by governments. And I do not understand about that segment too well, but whatever the public uh, information was coming in news. Um, so you are right in India, these policies are sort of leading to many business decisions, which we see in the last 10 or 15 years. I think Aadhaar and all those things yeah. are a manifestation of that. And many of these received massive criticism Hmm. and opposition yeah. uh, but then uh, now people are seeing that has put ourselves into a very different orbit itself so right. but yeah that's a that's that's a probably typical standard digression right that's <laughs> yeah. a standard digression of this podcast so yeah, going yeah. back to the three circles <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so center your circle you know yeah uh, right uh, so uh, l l let me uh, kind of uh, talk about uh, these three circles and the what I would request if anyone is kind of using this visual as a way to kind of center their concentration is start with the first circle, uh, then we'll talk about the circ second circle and then we'll talk about the third circle. So the first circle is something that we experience immediately. Um, we are an engineering team. Uh, you know, there is someone who has uh, started the project. Uh, we have been we have been handed over requirement in whatever way, be it agile, be it waterfall in whatever way. And hey, this needs to be done by this time. And, you know, these are the how many kind of budget you have. You've been given 10 people uh, here to form a team and do it in a proper way, do it again. And the, 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 that's the first set of stakeholder whose focus is that whatever has been asked of gets delivered properly, right? I've used the term SOW here, which kind of stands for um, statement of work in order to incorporate both worlds where uh, this uh, may be done by a vendor or a services company or uh, is being done by an in-house team, right? In any way, uh, you know, in vendor scenario, it's, sometimes it's very uh, uh, easy to understand that there is a budget, there's a time constraint, uh, but sometimes in in-house organization, that information is not very transparent. People, because they're employees, oh, I'm starting this project. They, there's so much of kind of uh, analog continuity of being involved in that organization. You don't realize that at this discrete point, this program kick-started and right. someone in the management has created a budget. So we set of employees come together, execute something, and at some point we have to finish it, right? Because yeah. of the cont analog continuity of an employment, these discrete uh, kind of get lost. And I feel that is one of the things that should should not be like that. People should be like, you know, you, you call it an external vendor. They know this is when my clock starts. This is when my clock ends. This kind of clarity on purpose and, uh, you know, the budget and the timeline should be clear to everyone. However, there are people whose focus is that, right? And these uh, folks uh, tend to be, you know, project managers, program managers, a GM who is kind of managing uh, that uh, set of activities, right? That That's their focus. So when you're going and talking to these set of folks, right? This is where you're talking to them about, hey, this is my velocity. Uh, this is the scope, how much we have covered, how much is uh, left over. And uh, we might have this dependency issue because of this. Now, you know, we may request some extra time. We may need some other things. We are blocked because of this. These are the things that are actually the, this, the focus of the person who's responsible for success of this first circle is unblocking. 
right? Uh, just so that you finish on time. So they, they, their focus is a lot on the mechanics of things, Correct. right? Uh, because the uh, idea is that if we deliver what we have promised on time, yeah, there might be a little bit scope here, there, but, uh, you know, maximum value would be delivered because whatever was promised was delivered, right? So this is that transactional thing that you were saying, right? Someone comes with a requirement, you go with the budget, they give you the budget and you compete within the budget, right? So in some way, it's very transactional, um, right? Uh, that That's part one. Now, uh, the other one is around the second circle. And in the second circle, what essentially is happening is that, okay, we are going and churning out this code. We are going as per the promised program, so on and so forth. Uh, what should we do now, right? Um, is it really leading to some value or not? One of the biggest things of Agile is that as we are going and pumping things into production, we are learning from it. We are seeing how customers are reacting to it. What is happening to the production? What kind of things are working? What kind of, and you kind of bring that learning back, and you kind of start making changes, right? Essentially, what that means is that there is a second circle who really want first circle to finish properly, they want the success, but they have some additional constraints. There's like, okay, what we are presenting, what we are producing, is it still relevant? Will it deliver the value that we wanted? Are these outcomes still true to the vision, right? And this is where typically a product manager comes into the picture because now what they're right. thinking is tech is a part of thing. I have to think about support. I have to think about legal. I have to think about collaterals that needs to be given to the marketing. So now your um, items which are coming into your umbrella for this whole activity to be successful has now gone beyond tech. It has started involving other departments of the organization, other kind of uh, you know activities. So now they this kind of circle is very interested that we are able to successfully deliver the outcomes that were expected and if what we had given as requirement is not sufficing we will keep on updating it right and the, that's and the this uh, this uh, you know tussle between this dynamics between second circle and first circle is where agile uh, kind of came in and solve a lot of problems, right? So these are the places where when someone is looking at kind of metrics and they're looking at how to be successful, they are uh, looking at, you know, okay, um, what kind of outcome uh, will define my success? Are we there yet? And uh, before I go into production, what kind of indicators I can see that will tell me that when we go live, we'll be able to handle the scale, the expectations. We will be able to shift our direction. Our business lead time is very less. We'll be able to push things very fast into the production. So as we are learning, we're uh, uh, you know changing. So that's the second circle. The third circle is where I think a lot of us um, struggle. I have one question, Dinkar. Yeah. In terms of, are, do these circles also coincide with the organizational structure? So it it almost kind of, uh, you know, Conway's law kind of dilemma there, right? Ideally, it shouldn't. Ideally, Not it shouldn't. But it does, right? If you see how someone gets organized is, yeah, there's a project team. And then there is a program team and that program team has, you know, has a bigger and they're responsible for it. And then there's a, so ideally it shouldn't. If if you think of cross-functional team, they should have a slice of all three in them. Yeah, like but, the, but, but the way I'm seeing is, for example, the first circle, I, I take a typical example of, let's say an investment uh, bank, right? Mm -hmm. So you are actually funding one program and then that program is working for, let's say risk department. Okay. Now, suddenly what happens is the second circle is the one which is, let's say, creating financial products. Yeah. And these financial product people also need risk product to be ready before they can launch you that financial exactly. product. Exactly. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the circle just expands and then there are like multiple parties involved, right? There will be a team which is doing marketing, legal team, which is creating a, a documentation for that. And for that, they need this risk product to be ready. Right. And also fill in the details. So in a unknowing way, all modern enterprises are shaped like this first circle and third circle. And I uh, so we'll go to third circle, but isn't this like very much like it's the uh, the radius, it keeps increasing 
and the stakeholders keep rising who are actually funding all of these programs together. So you are basically a Lego block in a larger uh, system. Right. So, uh, yes, you are right, but I I'm a little uh, hesitant to uh, uh, harden that analogy with uh, Got it. right because what that immediately will lead to and what we are seeing with a lot of you know people we work with this th these becomes hard boundaries and then this, you know uh, handing over handing over becomes right uh, th th these interfaces become very formal these interfaces become you know monthly updates and all that and that whole you know, cross-functional team, the synergy between them kind of loses. So right. at some point, yes, I, I agree with you, uh, but that is, it shouldn't lead to an organization structure like this. It will lead to dotted lines and dotted circles of like that, that I'm happy with. Uh, but ideally there should be a cross-functional, like the today the cross-functional does extend between one and two. In, in, in banking, it definitely doesn't. Uh, in some places it is. Um, in other organization, but it's the third circle, which is still kind of far removed. Understood. And into a lot of uh, angst that a lot of technologists are having because they don't have that dotted, you know, they're not, that cost function does not include those people. And let's right. come to circle three, right? So circle three are the set of people who are um, responsible for business outcomes, right? So these are the folks who are actually signing up on the check. Um, mm -hmm. you know, um, a typical organization, you are coming up, you know, end of year revenue numbers, you have this much of margin and then people decide, okay, from this uh, margin, uh, these are the five reinvestments we will do in our organization and they're making bets. Uh, let's put it here. Let's put it here. And like a typical portfolio, there would be some, you know, run the organization kind of bets, which make sure that what we are doing, we do it better. There might be, let's go and look, you know, some initiatives which help her explore some adjacent areas, something new, and some budget for something crazy. Uh, how can chat GTP um, change how, you know, banking is done? It's not a very crazy idea, but if you know the complexity <laughs> of banking environment, then you know it's quite a crazy idea, Um Right. So these are the folks who are doing this. Now, these are the folks who kind of hand over the investment and kind of say that come with one liner, right? Hey, uh, you know what? Um, you know, I'm going into a new market. Uh, I'm, I, I was always based in uh, North America. I'm now expanding into APAC. And, um, you know, my client onboarding is very geared towards um, uh, NA and can I have onboarding, which is now working for APAC? Now that's a very clear business ask with a very clear business um, outcome, right? I'm expanding my business. I want clients to be onboarded. No confusion, no clarity. Uh, sorry, uh, no confusion and no ambiguity, right? It's very clear ask. But the moment it reaches second level, they're going to think, okay, uh, this definitely goes beyond language. Now I'm in a different region. What kind of information can I gather? What kind of information can I hold? Uh, and suddenly it explodes into the scope and the complexity, right? And uh, by the time it reaches a project team, they, you know, oh, we're building up a form or we're building up an app, which people will click, click, click and provide some information, right? So unless there is this whole, the, the, the third circle, right? Unless the technologist who, unless the tech leader who is building an app, which allows someone to onboard, right? If that person goes and says that, you know what, um, uh, because our original uh, previous uh, onboarding app was in English, we are now doing this in English because it helps me reduce the scope. I can go out there in the market on time, very low budget. I finished it in low budget, awesome. Right. And uh, the, you know, the third circle person would say, but you know what we wanted to expand in, let's say, uh, China and Indonesia. And uh, it goes beyond, uh, you know, just these capabilities, the language changes, uh, the way they do their startups, the way they do their onboarding, the kind of suddenly has changed. So if there was not that continuity, the first circle can declare victory. Yeah, you know, we we have an onboarding for APAC in limited in the time, in the budget. But if they didn't understand clarity what the third 
um, you know, circle was looking for, if that communication was not happening, right? That awareness that I have to go and talk to that person, I have to showcase my value to them. So in order to know the value to them, I need to understand what they are thinking, right? If these communications were not happening, right? And that's the problem where a lot of these hardened boundaries create, then all would have been lost. So um, technologists have been very comfortable with first circle. With the advent of product management and agile, they're getting comfortable with the second circle, but there is a long journey for them to go and become comfortable with the third circle. That's where we are today. Yeah, and Dinkar, I would like to give you an example of these three circles and how technology should do uh, go about it, right? Um, sometimes when you think about success of business, right, and the ROI which business can do, uh, the most extreme example which I came across was um, for one of the largest earth-moving company in mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. They they make these giant uh, dump trucks. I mean, like they they are the largest vehicle in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they make that, the there are like a bunch of engineering people involved in it. So I'm particularly, I interacted with few tech people. And some of the devices they make, for technologists uh, like us, it's like super common. Like we can say that, hey, why don't you actually take it uh, to the service center and get something replaced? Uh, or downtime is just expected, right? But uh, one of the customer told, the moment this truck shuts off, for one hour because it is under maintenance or doing something or something they lose like 5500 to 7500 dollars per hour something like that that is the cost and impact so people who own these trucks their interest is to run it for the maximum amount of time hmm. and these mines work 24 7 so it is hmm. like obviously not 24 7 in true sense but they, they are round the clock machineries where uh, they are designed engineering wise. They are made to function in rugged terrains, very badly designed things. And uh, their constraints are extremely different. The customer's constraints of mindset are also very different. Mm. So uh, what we think, oh, I made a truck, then shouldn't the truck take like five, six hours of break? Then we can go and install this software. They say, I want you to install software once every six months. I don't care how fast you can de deploy software. Because every time you deploy software, my truck goes out of commission for six hours. That means the customer loses revenue of $50,000 to get an update of software. So if that software is not adding $50,000 worth of value to their life, yeah. they, they, they are not interested in getting that software at all. Yeah. And as you gave these three circles, this level of urgency has to uh, like come down and then probably engineering needs to think, hey, how can we have zero downtime updates? Yeah. See, that that that's the whole thing, right? Uh, zero downtime becomes a phrase. But when you put in the context of why zero time, yes. is, downtime is so critical, why someone is, it's not that someone is, uh, zero time, uh, zero downtime is not a reflection of your engineering excellence. It's a business need because no, you right. have to make uh, money every second from and, and yeah, so, and okay. let's say that I am an engineering team and I'm I, uh, a part of engineering team. And we said from four hours, we bring down the downtime to one hour. The impact which in the third circle our customers will receive is that we have 50, 1500 trucks currently commissioned in North America. Now multiply that by three hours less downtime on each truck every three months. Yeah, That is almost... 4500 into 4500 dollars that's kind of like uh, wastage saved now yeah. that's hypothetically how i would use your circle analogy to calculate benefit but yeah and this was interesting yeah and uh, I, I you know to kind of go back and recap right uh, the the whole idea behind this thought process is that as a technologist you understand uh, that uh, people who are looking at your work are looking at different levels of abstraction. And these three is uh, very common, what we have yes. seen. And you also need to understand that the work you're doing is being looked upon 
uh, is, is being looked at, uh, if that's the right uh, phrase, um, is looked at from people who are in these three circles at diff they have different expectations because of what they're doing. And when you do something, when you go and say that I have 99% downtime, probably the person in the first circle is taking, okay, this is an indication that you are a very good engineering organization. The second one is uh, looking at it, okay, that means, uh, you know, I have to think, if, if you're on all the time, I have to think of things like OTA updates while running updates. So they, they're coming up with, but the person who is at third level is saying that, oh, now I can go and tell my customer that you have an opportunity of three more hours of billing from these equipment. Exactly. So once you understand that, you know, just phrasing it in three different conversations, you have understood their mind space, their business complexities, their, uh, and you have become an effective technologist because now you're not just an awesome technology, but you're a whisperer of, you know, right um, <laughs> messages to the right set of people. Or maybe they were whispering, you just started hearing them now. <laughs> yeah. They had been screaming. <laughs> they had been screaming, but you were too busy with your... Um... Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It was nice. Yeah. This was a good uh, conversation, Sachin. And I, I know in the beginning, you made a passing remark on uh, chat GPT. And uh, both of us are um, doing a lot of interesting experiments there. And I think at some point, uh, we should... Um, bring that thread into this uh, you know engineering excellence to business outcome thread that we have been focusing on um, in absolutely this podcast. and uh, i mean uh, are they accepting any podcast without uh, chat gpt mentions anymore I mean, like, I think everybody has to talk, right? They have to have one episode on it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not not just an uh, episode in every, uh, yeah, this phrase has to do with this. The, there, is a, there is a scan which happens and if it is... A... <laughs> I'll be surprised if even Bollywood <laughs> part, <laughs> podcasts are actually not happening without Chai <laughs> Yeah, you, you never know. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Dinkar, we did not use... Maybe uh, the script, maybe the script, given exactly. the kind of scripts coming in. I'm sure for a long time, someone has been using a very remote, uh, you know, very, you know, backward version of chat GPT to churn out scripts for Bollywood movies. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially right. Bollywood. Yeah. Not hating, but, you know, complaining as a fan. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.